What's happening, y'all? Welcome inside the Fantasy Stock Exchange. Bush coming at you with another solo video. Today, we are going through the usual Wednesday special. Week 7, start and sit decisions. Quarterbacks, running backs, wide receivers, tight ends. We're going through every position group, every game, talking about the decisions you're going to have to make this week, who to start, who to sit, who to flex, who to drop, all that kind of stuff. So if at any point in this video, you guys felt like you gained some value, you want to support the channel in any way, you can go to your, the bottom of your screen right now, hit the button that looks like this. Like button helps the tra tra uh, channel out tremendously. You can also comment any of your questions, any thoughts you have, even if you just enjoyed the video, you want to let us know. Comment any of your thoughts down below. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Make sure you're hitting the bell icon so you're notified anytime we go live, anytime we post a new video because we go live before every primetime game, or at least we try to. Uh, paid support, if you wish to support the channel financially, you can go to patreon.com slash fantasy stock exchange. That link is in the description as well. As always, if you wish to, if you only want to know about Jerry Judy, for example, and you want to go quickly to that game and hear about that, uh, those players, you, there's timestamps in the description. You just click on the, the time that's listed there and you'll be able to go right to that game. You don't have to hear me talk about every single game. Um, we're going to hit the intro and then we're going to uh, get to the first game. All right, so bye weeks. Dolphins, Vikings, Colts, Ravens. Obviously, if you have any of these guys on your roster, you can't play them in your lineup. And most of these like fringe roster guys, like if you're carrying someone like Marcus Johnson or something, just drop him because he's on bye week. It's really not going to affect you that much. Um, kind of a new thing that I wanted to introduce each week. We're going to go through the fastest paced games before we get into the first game. Jared Smola tweets this out every week, and I figured it's pretty good knowledge. Um, so week seven's fastest paced games and what a fast paced game actually means. If you're not sure if you're new to fantasy or something, the more plays ran, the more offensive plays ran, the more offensive plays ran, the more pass attempts and rushing attempts there's going to be Ergo, the more fantasy points there's going to be. So Cowboys at Washington football team is slated to be the fastest paced game of the week. Steelers and Titans also very fast. And then Browns at Bengals also very fast. All right, so Thursday night football, the first uh, game we have this week. It was kind of nice last week not having Thursday night football, if you ask me, but New York Giants at Philadelphia Eagles is the game we have this week. At, at the quarterback position, you could stream Carson Wentz and you would sit Daniel Jones. Wentz is somehow the quarterback nine in fantasy this season. Don't ask me how, but despite playing with absolutely nothing in terms of skill positions and, and weapons, he has no receivers out there, and now he's without Zach Ertz. He's streamable, but as a low-end QB2 in this matchup, he's currently my quarterback 19 on the week. He's going up against a Giants defense that has low-key been stingy against quarterbacks, allowing only 17.6 points per game this season. When in, like I, I totally thought the Giants were going to be just this cake matchup. You could throw all over them, but the addition to James Bradbury and some of the other um, coaching additions that they have has actually made that defense a lot better. Same uh, sentiment I had last week with Daniel Jones. His passing volume just isn't there. The talent isn't there. He's not playing well. And the only thing that even remotely makes him startable or even attractive is his rushing volume. And he had a huge run last week. I don't expect him to break off a huge run like that again. He's normally like just like a high floor runner. But either way, um, Daniel Jones is not someone I want to be starting in this game. Running back wise in this game, Devontae Freeman, you can flex him. And Boston Scott is a high end RB3. So, Freeman's volume on a weekly basis makes him kind of live in this in this RB back end RB2 range because the offense sucks. So he doesn't really have much more upside than this. He doesn't have a lot of scoring opportunities or anything like that, but he is getting volume. So that does make him startable. Unfortunately, hopefully you don't have to start Devonte Freeman. You don't have him as like your RB2 or something, but if you are in that case, you can start him. Uh, Boston Scott, I'm willing to roll the dice with as a flex play, even though he disappointed in week one when Sanders was out the first time. And to be honest, mainly because people are just running low on uh, running back options as it is because of all the injuries to guys like Eckler and Chubb and all that stuff. You probably do have to start a guy like Boston Scott, especially with four teams on by this week and a lot of those teams having uh, quite good running backs like Jonathan Taylor and Dalvin Cook and all that stuff. So Boston Scott, I am willing to start if you need to. Wide receiver wise in this game, you start Darius Slayton, you sit Travis Fulgham, and you can low end to kind of flex play Greg Ward. So Slayton is expected to see shadow coverage versus Darius Slay and uh, per PFF, but I, I think Darius Slayton is the type of player that can break a play open on one play. So like, I, I don't want to totally just negate the fact that he's going up against Darius Slay. Plus Darius Slay has been, he's been good. He hasn't been like a complete shutdown guy. He's been kind of up or down or up and down. So I, I think Slayton will be fine in this game. 
Uh, Travis Fulgham, on the other hand, his primary f- defender and projected shadow matchup is expected to be James Bradbury, which makes him someone I don't want to start at all. I don't want to start Travis Fulgham against James Bradbury because James Bradbury has made way better receivers than Travis Fulgham. Pretty, pretty irrelevant so far this season. And as a result of that, Greg Ward becomes uh, in play knowing that he's going against Darnay Holmes. Tight end wise in this game, you could stream Evan Ingram. Um, as far as Zach Ertz goes, he's expected to be out three to four weeks. I think you can drop him in my opinion. The way that Zach Ertz has been playing and the fact that he's going to be out for a bit of time now, I think he's droppable because he has just not performed this year. And then Dallas Goddard is actually slated to come off IR this week, but he probably won't play. So I think he's a good stash. If you need like a um, another tight end option, you could stash him on your bench, but I, you're not going to be able to use him this week if I had to guess. And again, Evan Ingram, the guy sucks. The guy is not playing well. He's being used like Jason Witten and Jason Garrett's offense. His average depth of target is one of the lowest in the league at tight end but he's still top six in ECR for some reason. Like I have no idea what the experts are thinking on this one. He isn't good for fantasy at all, but he's a starting tight end. So that means he's streamable as a top 20 option, but we need to chill the fuck out with the top six ECR talk that keeps happening On to the 1 PM games. And these ones are a lot more interesting than the Thursday nighter quarterback wise in this Carolina at new Orleans game. You could stream Teddy Bridgewater and you could stream drew Brees. Uh, drew Brees is currently ECR 10, which uh, um, I feel like the public perception of Drew Brees is just way higher than he's actually played. But anyways, speaking of public perception, I think the two defenses in this game, their public perception is totally flipped. The way that people feel about the Saints defense, that it's like a bad matchup and you don't want to play anyone against it, is actually what is the case about the Panthers defense, which is super weird. Because the Saints have current, like uh, this season, they've been a top five matchup against fantasy quarterbacks. So they're, they're a great matchup for fantasy quarterbacks. And we've seen Teddy so far this season perform in smash spots. Last week, wasn't a good matchup. I told you to sit him. It was good if you did because he, he didn't have a good game. The Panthers, on the other hand, are bottom five, allowing 15.6 points per game to quarterbacks. And I would honestly, I would honestly sit Drew Brees in this game. He's quarter, he's quarterback 20 for me, which means you, inside my top 20 means he's a streamer, but he is 20. So he, if there's a lot of better options, uh, I think he would only, he only has finished top 15 once this season, despite his ECR 12 ranking this, this week. I honestly like, Again, I I don't really know what people are thinking in ECR, why they're ranking Drew Brees still so high, because he's only finished top 15 once this season. And there's a lot of other options uh, that I would rather play above Drew Brees. And the only silver lining for him is that the fact that he gets Crybaby Thomas back, which obviously is going to help the offense. Uh, In terms of running backs in this game, uh, you obviously start Alvin Kamara every week. Mike Davis, don't worry about the week he had last week. I think he'll bounce back in this one. And then Latavius Murray, if you're desperate, I think you can throw into your lineup because the Panthers are definitely a run funnel defense. You can run against them quite easily. The Panthers are currently allowing the fourth most points in uh, in the NFL to running backs. So Murray may be usable. As I mentioned, the two studs should be good to go. Davis had a very tough matchup last week against the Bears. And uh, he, for whatever reason, he didn't see a lot of target volume, which we've been accustomed to seeing from Mike Davis um, since Christian McCaffrey's been out. So I think he'll be fine in this game. At wide receiver, uh, Robbie Anderson and DJ Moore are startable. Thomas is startable if he plays, which I, I'm uh, willing to bet that he does. And I think you can low-end flex Emmanuel Sanders. So Michael Thomas should be back in this one after having his disciplinary absence, um, which, I mean, could have been bullshit if you ask me because they might have just wanted him to rest one more week before their bye week. Um, so that downgrades Sanders into wide receiver four or five territory as opposed to like wide receiver three range where he had been without Michael Thomas in the lineup. The matchups for these two teams are as follows. Um, Michael Thomas going up against Rasul Douglas is expected to be a shadow matchup. And same goes for Dante Jackson on Emmanuel Sanders. They're expecting those to be shadow matchups, which is kind of weird because those corners have played well, but I mean, they're not like shut down corners by any means. So I think they'll, I, I think Thomas and Sanders will still be okay in this one. But as I mentioned, the, the Panthers pass defense has actually been pretty good. So don't just assume this is like a huge smash spot and you can play Emmanuel Sanders with these. Cause again, Panthers defense has not been like the best matchup in the world. And uh, so as far as the Carolina side goes, we know what these guys are now. Robbie Anderson is the one a, or the number one outright. And DJ Moore is the one B or the number two outright. It'll be interesting to see how they deploy Lattimore in this game. But like, I don't think they're going to shadow DJ Moore on Marshawn Lattimore. I think they're going to play sides with him, but he will primarily be on DJ Moore, as you can see on the screen, which makes, Anderson, the much better play in this game going up against Patrick Robinson, who just gets toasted left and right. And I believe he's the one who gave up that big play to Mike Williams uh, at the end of the uh, the Chargers game, which should have won them the game. 
Uh, either way, Anderson is the guy you want to be playing in this offense. He's the guy you want to own in this offense because DJ Moore, for whatever reason, just isn't playing as well as he did last year. He's still playing okay, and he's still usable as like a back-end uh, wide receiver two, high-end wide receiver three. But Anderson is a top-20 receiver as far as I'm concerned. At the tight end position in this game, you could start Jared Cook with, with certainty, in my opinion. We all hoped that Jared Cook would see this huge target share without Michael Thomas, but that's not his role. His role didn't change when Michael Thomas went out. He's a big play guy. He's a red zone guy. And the offense overall sees an uptick with Michael Thomas back in the offense. So Cook actually sees an upgrade, in my opinion, with Michael Thomas coming back because the role that Cook has played hasn't changed. And his role is dependent on the offense being good, essentially. So Michael Thomas being back actually does help Jared Cook, in my opinion. So I'll roll out Jared Cook as a top 12 tight end this week and going forward with uh, relative ease. Uh, on to the next game, Buffalo at New York Jets. All right, so you could start Josh Allen like usual, and you'd sit whatever species starts for the New York Jets at quarterback. Maybe Allen isn't going to be the MVP type that we thought he was going to be coming off of his first couple games, but he's still a top five quarterback option. He should definitely rebound in this one after having a couple um, more rougher matchups in terms of the, uh, the offenses he played or the defenses he played against. Running back wise in this game, flex Singletary and low end flex Frank Gore. So Singletary proved last week that he needs to be alone in this backfield to get a high touch baseline. He only had nine carries, 10 carries and 10 carries. The three games that Moss has been present in the backfield so far this season. Plus, this is honestly just not a run game. You want a lot of pieces of rest of season because neither guy is playing super well. Singletary isn't averaging very high yards per carry or yards per touch or all that kind of stuff. And the offensive line isn't playing overly well. And Zach Moss isn't doing anything better. So in my opinion, I think these guys should have signed Le'Veon Bell because I think Le'Veon Bell could help them a lot more than he can help Kansas City. Either way, Singletary is a low-end flex or is um is a pretty high-end flex play because he does he is going to get solid volume. And then as far as Frank Gore goes, as I mentioned, um, Frank Gore is a solid piece uh, to get carries and all that kind of stuff with Le'Veon Bell now gone. If I were the Jets, I would not be giving carries to Frank Gore. I would be giving them to LaMichael P. Ryan so you could see what you have in the kid. But I mean, we'll see. I, I like, I'd imagine Frank Gore is, even though he got out snapped by P. Ryan, is still going to out touch him. So if you need someone, you, if you're desperate, you can play Frank Gore. Uh, at the wide receiver position in this game, you start Jamison Crowder, uh, Stephon Diggs, and I think you can flex John Brown as well. Uh, Jamison Crowder is basically what Jarvis Landry was a couple years ago. If, if you're if you're having trouble with being like, oh my God, Jamison Crowder is like not good. Jets offense isn't good. The way you need to think about Jamison Crowder is the way Jarvis Landry used to be. The only thing Adam Gase can actually do correctly is feed a slot receiver. Jamison Crowder is averaging 11 and a half targets per game, which is the most in the NFL right now in terms of targets per game that he's played. Diggs, you start every single week, and this is a great matchup for him. Uh, and then on the screen right now, you'll see what the matchups are. Um, Diggs going up against Pierre Desir, who's good at creating turnovers, but he can't actually cover, especially a guy like Stephon Diggs. And then John Brown going up uh, is worth uh, a look in the pinch as like a top 40 guy going up against Fugazi Lamar Jackson there, as you can see. And then tight end wise in this game, neither tight end is rosterable, rosterable at this point. I don't think you need to roster Dawson Knox or Chris Herndon, but I would still keep an eye out waiver wire speed dial or whatever for Chris Herndon once Gase is fired in case his offense and Sam Darnold, once he comes back, take a step forward. Uh, Cleveland at Cincinnati, the next game we have on the docket here, as I mentioned with the fast pace games, this is one of the more faster pace games of the slate. Uh, quarterback wise in this game, both guys are startable. Burrow is coming off of two horrendous matchups against the Ravens and Colts. And he's shown a lot of growth since these teams met the first time in week two. And I'd imagine he won't target AJ green a million times this time around. Um, like he did in week two. Burrow is actually my start of the week at the quarterback position. I have him inside my top 10. Baker is actually a decent streamer in this game as well. According to PFF, the Browns O-line has a 21% advantage over the Bengals D-line. And basically the thing with Baker Mayfield has honestly, like his whole career, he's terrible under pressure. Once he gets pressured, he plays like shit. If he's kept clean, he's usually efficient, much like Jared Goff, if you want to compare him to someone. And if he's pressured, obviously that's a different story, but the Bengals D-line has is outmatched by the Browns O-line according to PFF. So I think Baker is streamable in this game as well. Uh, to the running back position, you start Kareem Hunt and Joe Mixon, and then you low-end flex the Ernest Johnson, obviously. So with Joe Mixon, we're going to have to monitor his foot injury because as of uh, Wednesday when I'm recording this, I guess he isn't practicing, which could just be rest or could be Zach Taylor just taking it easy with him. We don't know yet, but Cleveland is not the best matchup. 
but it'll look like a cupcake compared to Baltimore and Indianapolis who Mixon actually did fairly well against considering um, the mismatch that the Bengals offensive line was against against those two D lines. All I can say though, is thank God I went against Kareem Hunt last week against Pittsburgh in my, uh, in my big money league, because Hunt is going bananas this week against Cincinnati. He already went off against Cincinnati the first time around. And that was with Chubb in the backfield. And this is kind of also why I think Dearness is playable in a pinch because I think there's going to be enough rushing volume to go around in this one. But Kareem Hunt is inside my top three at running back. I think he's an absolute smash start. And I'll probably be playing him in DFS this week. Wide receiver wise in this game, OBJ, Boyd, uh, OBJ and Boyd are the, the must start guys, obviously. And then Higgins is a flex play and then kind of low end flex play uh, for Jarvis Landry and AJ Green. Cleveland's low volume is always a risk with Odell, with Jarvis Landry, especially in a game where I expect the ground, the ground game, which Kareem Hunt is the primary guy there to carry the Browns. So I'll start Odell in this game, but I don't want to use Landry as anything more than like a high end wide receiver for on the, on the screen. You'll see what the matchups are. William Jackson going up against Odell Beckham. Odell Beckham is actually like slightly favored in that one, but either way, I think uh, Odell should have a pretty solid role in this game. Jarvis Landry, maybe not so much going up against Mackenzie Alexander. And then on the Bengals side of things, Boyd is really as, as consistent as they come. He, I have no issue starting him as a top 24 guy pretty much every week. And as I mentioned, that the last two weeks, the Bengals offense was just overmatched by the defenses they played. And T. Higgins in this, uh, in this offense is in flex territory very firmly for me, considering he has seen six, nine, seven, eight, eight targets since week two when he was uh, becoming a full-time starter. I don't think it's crazy to start T. Higgins over a guy like DJ Moore. I don't think it's crazy to start T Higgins over Darius Slayton or Juju Smith-Schuster. All, all of these guys that I just mentioned, ECR is higher on than T Higgins. So I have T Higgins ranked above all those guys currently. And I think um, the way that T Higgins is playing is just going to get better and better because he's a rookie receiver developing a rapport with a young quarterback. And I think it's just going to continue to flourish. Hopefully AJ Green can do his only job, which we want him to do for fantasy in this game. And that's take away Denzel Ward and shadow coverage. I don't think he's going to get shadowed by Denzel Ward but hopefully he's on AJ Green the majority of the time. Uh, tight end wise in this game, start Hooper. And I would say Drew Sample only if you're absolutely desperate. So Hooper is consistently getting targets since his slow start. He had a really slow start at the beginning of the season. A lot of people dropped him probably. So you can definitely roll with him uh, out there as like a top 15 option going forward right now because he is getting targets now. And then Drew Sample hasn't been getting a lot of targets, but he did perform well against Cleveland in week two. So he's worth a shot if you're desperate and you have like Andrews or Gasecki or Irv Smith or something on by. So I think you can, you can start Sample if you're absolutely screwed right now and you need to just pick up someone off the waiver wire. Um, on to the next game, Dallas at Washington, which again, as I mentioned with the fast pace games, this is the fastest pace game of the slate. Quarterback wise in this game, I think Dalton and Allen are both streamable quarterbacks in this game. They are both on the fringe for me as quarterback 19 and 21. So I think you can stream both guys. Um, Dalton is more like 60% of DAC than we thought. I thought he was going to be more like 80% of DAC, but 60%, I mean, that's it's still a solid streamer at that point. Uh, this isn't the easiest matchup either, though, uh, for Andy Dalton, as most quarterbacks that have succeeded against the Washington football team defense thus far have done so through rushing, as we saw with Daniel Jones last week. Um and then Kyle Allen in this game, he had a solid game last week against the Giants defense, which, as I mentioned, hasn't been that great for uh, opposing quarterbacks. And this is a, a defense that is just absolutely giving away fantasy points to the quarterback position in the in the Cowboys. So running back position in this game, you fire up Zeke and Gibson and Gibson's actually my start of the week. If Kenyon Drake can look this good, uh, as good as he did last week against the Cowboys run defense, this may be the Gibson breakout game that us Gibson owners and myself included have all been waiting for. Gibson has been consistently 14 to 18 touches every single week. But this game, if he breaks like a long one or just the game scripts out of hand because Washington's winning this game or he's just looking super electric so the coaching staff feeds the hot hand kind of thing, I think he could he could definitely have his breakout game in this one and that's why he's my start of the week. Zeke is honestly playing like shit right now, but I think you got to hold with Zeke. You can't, like, don't sell him. I'm telling you right now, do not sell Zeke right now. And just hope things get better for him and the Cowboys offense because Zeke is too big of a piece. He gets too much volume and he's too talented to just sell for, I don't know, like James Robinson or something. So just don't sell Zeke if you have him right now and you're worried. Uh, to the wide receiver position in this game, you start Terry McLaurin, CD, and uh, Amari Cooper, and you sit Michael Gallup. 
So Terry going up against Daryl Worley is actually one of the biggest advantages of the week in, ter uh, in terms of PFF advantage uh, percentage. He's performed in some very bad matchups this uh, so far this season, including last week against James Bradbury. So he's firmly in my top eight this week because he's got a very easy matchup finally. Um, in terms of Michael Gallup, the reason I say to sit him is because he was inconsistent with Dak Prescott. Now I don't even want to start him at all, like because he's going up against a stingy pass defense, as I mentioned in the Washington football team. But the other two guys are getting too good of volume, including Dalton Schultz too. Michael Gallup's like the fourth option in this passing game. So I don't want to start him at all. And as I mentioned with the other two guys, Amari Cooper and CeeDee Lamb, they're getting good enough volume that you can start them pretty much every week. The matchups are as follows. Amari Cooper going up against Darby, who's been pretty good so far this season. CD Lamb going up against Jimmy Moreland, which is the best matchup on the field. And then Michael Gallup, as usual, has the worst matchup on the field going up against Kendall Fuller. And the way that Michael Gallup is used, he's used down the field, which is like clearly harder for you to connect on those plays. And the way Dalton is playing right now, I just don't want to trust him making big plays and stuff because Gallup and Dalton, neither of them are playing super well. And I, I just don't really want any part of that uh, connection. Uh, to the tight end position in this game, you can start Dalton Schultz for sure. And I think in a pinch, you can stream Logan Thomas. Uh, Schultz also sees a downtick, obviously, since Dak went down as the entire offense did. But he's still a, vi a viable tight end one until I see his usage fall off a cliff. And then Thomas had a good game last week. I don't really want to be chasing his touchdown that he scored. But again, if you have Gesicki and Andrews and all these guys on by and you absolutely need someone on the waiver wire to throw into your lineup and start, I think you can do it with Logan Thomas. So Green Bay at Houston, the next game that we have here. Quarterback-wise, fire them both up. Both guys have are every week starters. Rodgers and Watson, both every week starters. I wouldn't be too mad at Aaron Rodgers. He was going up against the best defense in the NFL. Go Bucks! Uh, and they shut him down last week. Uh, running back wise in this game, you start Aaron Jones, obviously, and you start David Johnson. This should be a high scoring game. Jones will probably go off against this Houston run defense that just has not been good at all. And DJ should have a chance to fall his old ass into the end zone, but I'm expecting his usual 3.3 .3 per carry that he usually puts up. You just got to hope David Johnson gets into the end zone. And as I mentioned, this is a high scoring game potentially. So you should have a lot of scoring opportunities. Wide receiver wise in this game, you could start Devonte Adams, Will Fuller and Brandon Cooks. And then I think MVS and Randall Cobb are kind of like desperation flex plays. Hopefully in this game, the let Watson cook movement that has happened since Bill O'Brien was fired continues. And the two Texans guys have been a big time beneficiary of this with cooks and fuller um, fuller and Adams will likely be shadowed in this game. Um, Jair Alexander going up against Will Fuller I actually have both of them, uh, both the matchups on the screen. Cause alphabetically they just lined up. Um, Jair Alexander will likely be shadowing Will Fuller and Bradley Roby will likely be shadowing Devontae Adams. Um, Alexander going up against Fuller is a little scary considering how good Alexander has played this year. Um, Roby versus Adams, I'm not really concerned about. I think Adams will take care of him. Uh, but Brandon Cooks might be the smarter play if you, I don't know, maybe you have Brandon Cooks on your roster and you're not sure whether to play him or not. Keep in mind that Will Fuller does have a bad matchup. So Brandon Cooks could be uh, a guy that could eat in this game. And then again, as I mentioned with Randall Cobb and MBS, they have solid matchups so that you could also throw them out in a pinch as well uh, to the tight end position in this game, start Robert Tanyan and Darren Fells, but only if Jordan Akins is out for Fells. both guys are top 15 starts in this game. If Akins is out, as I mentioned, um, because it's, it's a high scoring game and you just want pieces of it, to be honest. And then uh, to the next game we have here is Detroit at Atlanta. The quarterbacks in this game are both top 12 uh, Stafford over Ryan. If I have to pick between the two guys, but the Falcons are dead last in allowing fantasy points to the quarterback position. And the lions are so bad against the run, giving up the second lowest passing yards in the, uh, in the NFL right now, that it's possible that Todd Gurley is the one that does the damage for Atlanta, not Matt Ryan in the passing game, but nonetheless, this one should be high scoring um, as a lot of these games will be probably on this slate uh, to the running back position. All right, DeAndre Swift had his kind of breakout game this past week. Is he the back to own in Detroit? Yes. Obviously, you'd love to see him look good and, and get some uh, touches finally. But I do I trust Matt Patricia to do the right thing and start playing his, his 35th overall pick running back instead of a 35-year-old running back in Adrian Peterson? Absolutely not. I don't trust Matt Patricia to do that at all. So he is startable this week as a top 24 guy. But don't be surprised if this time next week I'm going like, Man, DeAndre Swift disappointed and got five touches. Like, it's very possible that that happens still. And I would not be selling the farm for him in a trade quite yet. If you were smart, you probably would have traded for him two weeks ago when he had very little value, maybe even was dropped. Um, 
in terms of like the the usage in that backfield, Jared Small tweeted this out with the uh, the snap rates. DeAndre Swift only had a 38% snap share last week. Even though he did have the most opportunities, he's still not playing like a feature back is like 55, 60, 65%. Like you need DeAndre Swift to be getting closer to that 50% range before you can feel good about him for the rest of the season, not just like um, this week. And then uh, in terms of Todd Gurley, you could just copy and paste every argument I've ever made for Todd Gurley because the guy sucks. He's not good, but he gets volume. And this is another cupcake matchup that he's going to have. I swear to God, he's had the best matchup or schedule in the entire league. Uh, so he's in my top 15 again, because this is a great matchup. To the wide receiver position, this one's pretty easy. You start the usuals. Julio, Ridley, Galladay. Galladay currently has the highest advantage of any wide receiver per PFF this week. And in terms of Marvin Jones, you can drop him. He has been he has been brutal this season. He's washed up. He's over the hill. So uh, as you can see on the screen, I have the wide receiver cornerback matchups uh, advantages, the biggest ones on the week, tweeted out. And you can see Kenny, Kenny G going up against Kendall Sheffield is the biggest one on the week. And I tweet these out usually on Tuesday every single week. So make sure you're following me along on Twitter to see stuff like this. And I also tweet out a bunch of other stuff as well. Uh, Calvin Ridley and Julio Jones return to every week's starter status, obviously, now that Julio Jones looks like he's healthy and Ridley looks like he's healthy. So that's good for you guys who bought low on Julio Jones. And I think you can even desperation play Russell Gage in this one. Uh, the matchups for these uh, Atlanta Falcons receivers are as follows with Julio Jones going up against Imani O, which is a very high advantage Julio. And then Calvin Ridley going up against Jeff Okuda, which is also very high advantage Calvin Ridley. And then Russell Gage going up against Daryl Roberts. If you're in a pinch, you can throw him into your lineup as well. And then to the tight end position, you start TJ Hawkinson and you stream Hayden Hurst. Perhaps one of the mis most disappointing players in fantasy this year is Hayden Hurst. Thankfully, he's bailed you out a couple times if you've had to play him with big plays and garbage time touchdowns. So he's st still streamable as a top 16 tight end for me, but he's not exactly what um, myself, including uh, a lot of other people, thought we were getting with Hayden Hurst. We thought he was going to be slide in right to that Austin Hooper role, and that is not what ha has happened so far. Uh, TJ Hawkinson has been the primary benefactor, to be honest, of Marvin Jones' struggles. He's a top tight, uh, top eight tight end rest of season for me. He's been incredible. He's looked great. And I think he's just going to continue to get better and continue to get more involved as Marvin Jones continues to struggle. So uh, to the next game, Pittsburgh at Tennessee. And this one also a very fast paced game should be very high scoring as well. Quarterback wise in this one, both of them are starts. I think the loss of Luan, uh, the left tackle for the Titans, who's one of the better left tackles in the league might be pretty big in this one for the Pittsburgh front, which has currently the highest mismatch in pass pro per PFF right now at 49%. Ryan Tannehill might be under some pressure in this one. And he's, he's currently at my quarterback 17. So I am lower than ECR, but I, I think the Steelers dominate this game in the trenches, which, which is the reason I bet on the Steelers in this one. But uh, it is worth noting that Tannehill has actually been excellent under pressure. So if he is in a lot of pressure, he's one of those quarterbacks that can handle it unlike if he was like a Baker Mayfield or a Jared Goff or something. And then in the Pittsburgh game, I think or from the Pittsburgh side of things, I think Ben will be actually forced to throw a lot more than he has in the past couple of games. He's they've blown out a couple of teams, to be honest. So Ben hasn't been forced to do too much. I think in this game, he's actually going to be kind of let loose and forced to throw a bit more to the running back position. I think you can start both guys as well. Uh, they're basically just the workhorses of their backfield and what should be a relatively higher scoring game as well. Even though both of these match or both of these defenses are pretty tough against running backs, I think given the fact that James Conner got 20 carries last week and Derrick Henry just broke 200 yards rushing, I think you can feel pretty safe about starting both guys. Uh, to the wide receiver position in this game, you could start AJ Brown, you start Chase, Chase Claypool, you start Deontay Johnson if he plays, and then you flex Juju and um, and Corey Davis as well. To the uh, the Titans receiver core is pretty simple, unlike the Steelers receiver core, but. AJ Brown is the stud I predicted in the preseason. I'm, I'm going to take a victory lap right now because people were concerned about target volume and regression and all this kind of stuff. When like, again, newsflash, when a guy's really good as a rookie, he's just going to continue to get more volume. He's going to continue to get better. And that's exactly what's happening with AJ Brown. He's looking like the stud Chris Godwin type receiver that I thought he was going to be. And Corey Davis coming back from the COVID list should be flex worthy in this game, especially if John Smith is out for this one to the, um, uh, to the matchup chart, you could see that A.J. Brown going up against Steven Nelson. I think he's going to absolutely wipe the floor with him because he has not been nearly as good as he was last year. Uh, Steven Nelson, that is. And then Corey Davis going up against Joe Hayden's a bit more of a tougher matchup, but I think he can uh, do all right. And then I think if you're absolutely desperate, Adam Humphreys gets some targets. So if you're if you're screwed this week and you have no one you can start, then Adam Humphreys isn't terrible. 
All right. So the Steelers wide receiver core, it's a complete mess right now. My thoughts are as follows. If Chase Claypool is on your team, you have to start him. I know he's, we, we don't know what his usage is with Deontay Johnson and all that stuff. I don't care because the way Chase Claypool is playing, you, you have to play him. You cannot sit this guy. If Deontay is back, that I think you could start him as well as a top 30 guy. Also, I think it's, it sounds like he's close by some of the reports that I was able to find on Deontay Johnson uh, to coming back. So I think if he's back, then you can start him as well. Juju Smith-Schuster on the other hand has been pretty much neutered by these young guys uh, emerging and he's still a top 35 guy, but he's not the wide receiver one to two that you drafted uh, in the third, fourth round. So uh, Mike Clay tweeted this out. Juju Smith-Schuster actually leaves, leads the Steelers in targets but he's fifth in air yards on the team, which means he's basically a Randall Cobb, Larry Fitzgerald, Golden Tate. Like he's getting low target or uh, low A dot type targets. So basically with Juju, one, you need to be in a PPR league because he's not really giving you anything in terms of big plays, but two, he needs to get a lot of targets in order to be good, which is not really happening right now. Um, the matchup chart is as follows. Uh, Juju Smith-Schuster is going up against Christian Fulton. Uh, Chase Claypool going up against Jonathan Joseph, who's been pretty solid, but Chase Claypool has just been on a, a, on a complete mission right now. So I wouldn't count him out against anyone. And then uh, James Washington, they don't expect Deontay Johnson to be back, at least not yet. But um, again, if Deontay Johnson is out, that upgrades both Claypool and Smith Schuster for me. But I do think Deontay Johnson is going to be back based on what I've read so far. And then to the tight end position in this game, you start Ebron and then Jonu if he's healthy. If Jonu is out, I think you could stream Anthony Ferkser as like a top 20 tight end. But uh, I, I I have a feeling that Jonu's going to be able to play, but I could be wrong about that. Uh, Eric Ebron's bad game last week was all game script related. They were killing the Browns and that's why Eric Ebron had a bad game. So don't be worried about that. Uh, to the 4 p.m. slates, the Seattle Seahawks going to the Arizona Cardinals. Both guys at quarterback are obviously every week starters. You don't sit Russell Wilson or Kyler Murray. Uh, to the running back position, you start both of the main two running backs, so Kenyon Drake and Chris Carson, and I think you could flex Chase Edmonds still in a pinch. If you could sell Drake, personally, I probably would because the defense that he did that against has literally had like quotes come out about the Cowboys' defense saying that the coaches are like unprepared and they don't know what they're doing, which, I mean, that's fantasy gold, knowing that you could just start everyone against the Cowboys, but um, that's bad news if you're a Cowboys fan, rip Danny, because a coach that doesn't know what he's doing, like Mike McCarthy already lied about like watching every Cowboys game before he got the job. Like it, that hire is not looking great right now. And obviously Dak getting hurt doesn't help, but uh, the good teams can coach around that. And the Cowboys are not looking like a good team. And it's not like you have a terrible quarterback. You have Andy Dalton, who's been a starter for like 10 years. Either way, Kenyon Drake has failed to perform in other great matchups. He, he did bad against the Panthers, against the Lions against like bad run defenses. He's just performing in this game. And now everyone's like, oh man, he's back. He's the guy like, no, Kenyon Drake is still on the fence. He's still like a fringe RB two. If you can get a guy like Antonio Gibson for him, a guy like DeAndre Swift for him, a guy like Ronald Jones for him, a guy like Daryl Henderson for him, I would probably do it because Kenyon Drake is getting inched. His, his role is still getting eaten into by Chase Edmonds. And I think that's going to continue to happen uh, to the wide receiver position in this. And then Chris Carson, don't worry about Chris Carson. You start him every week. Um, to the wide receiver position, DeAndre Hopkins gets Quentin Dunbar in coverage for a 31% advantage, according to PFF, but that's about it for the Cardinals. I'm not chasing Christian Kirk's big play that he had or any of the Cardinals wide receivers, not named DeAndre Hopkins, uh, for that matter, because you're never going to guess who gets it. And not only that, but Kyler Murray hasn't been like the greatest in terms of throwing the ball. He's been a lot, a lot of his value has come from throwing to Hopkins and on the ground. So it's not like a high volume passing offense. I don't, I don't think Kyler th completed more than like 10 passes last week. So um, Kyler Lockett uh, and the Seahawks receivers, you you want to be starting them every single week, obviously. Lockett, in my opinion, is one of the best buy lows in fantasy right now. If you can flip a piece that's like maybe more consistent than Tyler Lockett, maybe the Tyler Lockett owner is getting a little bit pissed off that Lockett's kind of up and down. If you could flip a piece like Robert Woods, or Robbie Anderson, or someone who's more consi uh, consistent than Tyler Lockett, I would much rather have Tyler Lockett because his booms are crazy, and you want to be attached to this offense. So I would do that in a heartbeat if you're able to do that. Metcalf, on the other hand, no one's going to be sitting this dude. He should see shadow coverage from Patrick Peterson in this game, who actually did a decent job against Amari Cooper. But Metcalf will probably take his money and uh, his lunch money and give him a wedgie in this one. Like I like Metcalf is a man on a mission right now. Um, the matchup chart doesn't show him on Patrick Peterson, but it has come out saying that DK Metcalf is expected to be shadowed. I, I think he's going to wipe the floor with the dude. Patrick Peterson has looked, has shown his age and Metcalf has shown his freakish ability so far this season. 
And then tight end wise in this game, I think you sit Greg Olson, whatever other tight ends you're considering starting. You don't start any Cardinals tight ends. So don't worry about that. Kansas city at Denver um, quarterback wise, obviously you start Patrick Mahomes and then you sit drew Locke. The simple, simple reasoning for this is one's very good at football and one is not so much. Um, I don't really care what the game script is. I don't want to start drew Locke because the chiefs defense in its element has been one that they get up early and then they just stack the crap out of you and get a lot of turnovers. And I think drew lock in that environment can't end well. So to the running back position, and this obviously is a backfield that had a lot of change recently with the signing of Le'Veon Bell, you start Clyde Edwards, Hilaire, you sit Le'Veon Bell. And then on the Broncos side of thing, also kind of a murky backfield right now, you start Melvin Gordon and you can flex Philip Lindsay in a pinch. So on the Chiefs side of things, Clyde played exceptional in week eight, uh, in week six, sorry. And he should continue his feature role for week seven as Bell is just kind of getting with the team now. He just got through the COVID pro- protocols and he's still learning the playbook. So I wouldn't screw around flexing Levy on Bell just yet. And I think you could start Clyde with confidence. Uh, Michael Fabiano, formerly of uh, NFL Network, I believe he works for like Sirius XM now. He tweeted out um, saying that Jay Glazer reported that Levy on Bell addition was only to spell Clyde Edwards Lair. Basically, they they just don't want him getting too much carries. He's, he, Clyde's a small guy. Like they, they don't want him taking the dirty carries probably. So that's basically what the Le'Veon Bell signing was about, according to Jay Glazer. And he probably, he doesn't report stuff that, just that he thinks. He, he reports what he's heard. So that's probably what Brett Veach or whoever Chiefs uh, connections that he has told him. So uh, to the Denver Broncos side of things in the running back position, Gordon supposedly had strep throat last week. I mean, that could be a crock of shit and he was disciplined for his DUI that he got. Either way, if he's back and they expect him to be back, He's a low end RB two and Lindsay is downgraded to a low end flex. If Gordon's out, obviously then Lindsay's like a, an RB two and you can start him with relative confidence in this game to the wide receiver position. Uh, this one's kind of murky, but you start Tyree kill. Obviously you could flex Jerry Judy and then you pick your poison with anyone else outside of Tyree kill and Judy, all of these dudes, Robinson uh, for the chiefs, Hardman for the chiefs, and then Tim Patrick for the Broncos all could do well, or they could all drop donuts. So, I mean, they're all in wide receiver four or five range for me. Hardman, according to this, has a good matchup. If, as you can see on the screen right now, he's going up against Devontae uh, Bosby, which, I mean, probably not going to be too well uh, for that guy. Um, but he also could drop a donut like he did last week. So who the hell knows with uh, McCole Hardman? It's a risk anytime you throw him into your lineup. Uh, to the tight end position, obviously you start Travis Kelsey every week. And then Noah Fant, if he's back, is, I mean, he's someone I would easily take over these fringe tight end one guys like Tanyan and Schultz and Jimmy Graham. I'd much rather have Noah Fant going forward because he's proven that he's like a big play waiting to happen. And I, I, if he's back in this game, I expect him to do well. So he's definitely a strong start. He's probably the strongest start of any Broncos player on the entire team, to be honest, going forward. Uh, to Jacksonville at Los Angeles Chargers. Quarterback-wise in this game, you start Gardner Minshew and Justin Herbert. Both guys are startable with Herbert being a really strong start, in my opinion. Both teams are fairly weak against quarterbacks and this game should have kind of sneaky shootout potential to the running back position in this game. You start James Robinson and Justin Jackson, and then you could flex Josh Kelly in a pinch. So on top of Justin Jackson's 21 opportunities last week, he, or two weeks ago, he also played 59% of uh, the snaps. So as far as I'm concerned, Justin Jackson is like 80% of what you were getting from Austin Eckler. And Kelly has the same role that he had when Eckler was there. So that's basically how I see the backfield. It could change. Maybe Kelly gets a lot of work in this one. If the game script gets out of hand and the Chargers start winning, they might just run Kelly, and that's very possible. But I do think Justin Jackson is the primary running back uh, to own in this backfield while Austin Eckler's out. To the wide receiver position, you start DJ Chark and Keenan Allen. You could flex Mike Williams and LaVisca Chenault, and then you can desperation start Keelan Cole if you absolutely need someone. So a lot of layers here for this one. One, is Casey Hayward shadowing Chark? As of right now, PFF says, no, he's not going to be. So, I mean, that that doesn't downgrade him or anything like that, but he is expected to see Michael Davis, as you can see on the screen. But I would have expected Casey Hayward to shadow him. We, we, I honestly have no idea what's going to happen with that. But as of right now, you have to assume that DJ Chark is not shadowed by Casey Hayward. Chark saw 14 targets last week and over 200 air yards. He only turned it into like seven receptions for like 40 yards, but that's great volume. And, and hopefully Gardner and him are able to uh, get back on track. So I'm still willing to play DJ Chark. Um, currently in my home league, I'm, I'm playing Antonio Gibson over him, but I mean, that's a pretty coin toss type decision. If you have that kind of flex decision yourself, that's kind of the range I see DJ Chark in. Um, LaVisca Chenault is still a solid flex starter every week. And Keelan Cole, in my opinion, he got lucky last week and I'm not chasing the big game that he had. 
I think he's probably going to disappoint in this week if people continue to start him. And then to the Chargers side of things, Keenan is, is locked in as one of the best, best matchups on the week uh, for any wide receiver. And then Mike Williams is always a risk of disappointing, but in a good matchup, you could feel relatively confident that he'll get some targets going up against Sidney Jones, who hasn't been the greatest so far this season. As I mentioned, Keenan Allen going up against Trey Herndon ain't going to end well. Uh, tight end wise, Hunter Henry has only had one game with less than seven targets. And that was against the bucks, which again is the best defense in the NFL. So I I'm not going to blame too much on Hunter Henry. I think he's a great start at tight end and he's a top 10 tight end going forward. Uh, San Francisco at new England, Jimmy Garoppolo is a sit in this game and you could start Cam Newton. The rushing rushing usage for Cam Newton is out of this world for Cam. Not, uh, you have to play him every single week. The last week he had 157 yards, zero touchdowns and two picks as a passer. And he still managed to finish top 12 because he had a rushing touchdown and he had like uh, 12 carries or whatever. So that's how high his rushing floor is, is that he can have a terrible passing day like that and still be good for fantasy. And then Jimmy Garoppolo, obviously going up against the Patriots defense. You just don't want any part of that. And then uh, running back wise in this game, you could start McKinnon and you could flex James White with Mostert out. We're back to square one with this backfield and Jet McKinnon is, is an RB an RB2 and Jeff Wilson is a low end flex play. Uh, and again, pick your poison with the Patriots backfield. You could theoretically low end flex any one of these guys, James White, uh, Damian Harris or Rex Burkhead, or you could start none of them at all, which is the option I'm going to choose to do because I don't own them anywhere. But if you do own one of these guys and you're in a pinch because you have Dalvin cook on by or whatever the case is, then I guess you could start any of these guys as like top 40 running backs, but I don't feel good about any of them. Um, Wide receiver wise in this game, you could flex Debo Samuel and Brandon Ayuk and Julian Edelman. So Edelman had a great matchup last week and he friggin' stunk. So he's permanently in low end wide receiver three territory for me going forward. But I do think you can flex him again because there's bye weeks and injuries and all that kind of stuff. You probably have to. Uh, they don't expect shadows in this game for the San Francisco wide receivers. As you can see on the screen right now, Debo Samuel going up against JC Jackson, Brandon Ayuk going up against Steph Gilmore. But both dudes have rough, rough matchups. Both those guys are great corners. You don't want any part of them. Um, they're both low end wide receiver threes for me. You could still start them if you need to. But again, if you have better options, then I would opt to go for those, uh, those instead. To the tight end position, obviously you start Kittle, but uh, you, you could see kind of like what happened to Darren Waller going up against the Patriots. If, cause you know, Bill Belichick will always take away your best weapon. Obviously for the 49ers, that is George Kittle. So maybe they, I don't know, maybe they put Steph Gilmore on him. I don't know. Either way, I think George Kittle is probably um, not going to have one of his greatest games in this one, but he'll still probably be solid. Sunday night football, uh, my Buccaneers take on the Las Vegas Raiders in Las Vegas. Quarterback-wise in this game, you start Tom Brady and you sit Derek Carr. So the only hit to Tom Brady's ceiling is the fact that this is one of the worst run defenses in the NFL, and we could see another Rojo outing uh, where he just carries the load and, and is great in this one. Um, to the running back position, obviously you start Ronald Jones and Josh Jacobs as well. And then you sit Leonard Fournette if he plays, which I think he's going to. Ronald Jones is on an absolute tear right now. And I, as I've mentioned, he's a week to week player. So don't go thinking that in Ronald Jones, you have a top 12 running back the rest of the season, or top 15 running back the rest of the season. He's currently the RB 12 in PPR right now, but that is a week to week thing with Ronald Jones. And if you're willing to sell, if you want to sell him high, I totally don't blame you because he, he like Bruce Arians has shown propensity to go away from Ronald Jones. But I currently have him in my big money league and I'm going to hold him. Fournette will likely be limited in this game specifically as a spell for Rojo coming off of the ankle injury. He's probably going to work in anytime Rojo gets three straight carries or whatever, then Fournette's going to come in. Either way, Ronald Jones is a great start in this one. Uh, Josh Jacobs is going to struggle this game on the ground. As we saw last week with Aaron Jones, 10 carries for 15 yards. I know Jamal Williams had a decent run and AJ Dillon had a good run in garbage time, but this run defense is legit. Even without Vita Vea, they just picked up uh, a nose tackle from the Jets who supposedly is good at one thing and one thing only, and that's stopping the run. So I think uh, Josh Jacobs needs, he better score a touchdown or catch some passes in this game, or he's going to be bad for fantasy this week. Uh, to the wide receiver position, I think you start Mike Evans, you start Chris Godwin, and I think you could start Ruggs or um, Renfro if you're absolutely desperate, but I don't really want to start those guys. I've said it before, but Mike Evans is the most predictable wide receiver in the NFL in terms of fantasy production. His bad games come when he's shadowed against good corners. That's just basically all it comes down to. Lattimore and Alexander, his two worst games of the season against the Packers and the Saints when he was shadowed by two good corners. He's got Nevin Lawson this week, as you can see on the matchup chart right there. That's wheels up. It's 22% advantage for Mike Evans. And as you can also see on the matchup chart, Chris Godwin also has a great matchup. And my kind of game prediction 
in this one is that the Bucks offense does what the Bucks defense did last week, where we were everyone's talking about the Bucks defense right now. They're like, oh my God, this defense is so fast. It's so young. It's so physical. I could see the Bucks offense having their time in the sun after this game because the Raiders defense is decimated. Their best corners out with COVID. They, like they're, the team is not in good shape right now. And I think the Bucks offense could really take advantage in this game. Um, in terms of the Raiders, uh, Ruggs does not have a good matchup. He's going up against PFF's number two corner on the season, and that's Jamel Dean. And Jamel Dean runs a 4-3 flat, so he could keep up with Henry Ruggs. And he's also very physical and very big, so you might bully him around at the line of scrimmage. Um, Hunter Renfro actually has the best matchup. If you're looking for a desperation play in this game, or if you're going to play a showdown slate or something, Hunter Renfro is the best start at the wide receiver position in this game going up against SMB in the slot. Um but I, again, I don't really want to start any of these guys. Uh, to the tight end position, Gronk and Waller are both starts in this game. Godwin being back. And again, this is a lot like what it was for Jared Cook. Yes, we want Gronkowski to get a lot of volume, but that's not who Gronkowski is at this point in his career. He is more there for touchdowns. He's more there for bigger plays type thing like that. So the offense being better helps Gronkowski. And Godwin makes this offense better. And according to PFF, as I tweeted this out earlier today, Rob Gronkowski has a 78% advantage over Corey Littleton, who was really good in coverage last year, but it apparently is not so good in coverage this year. And no other tight end has even close to this kind of advantage. Do the Bears at the Rams, Monday night football, last game of the week. You sit both quarterbacks because Jared, I've mentioned this before. You always know when to sit Jared Goff. Jared Goff going up against a good defense. You'd never play him against a good defense. In this game, he's going up against a good defense. You sit him. Nick Foles isn't that good. Don't don't play Nick Foles against the Rams defense, who's very good right now. And then uh, to the running back position, you start David Montgomery and you start Daryl Henderson. Although Montgomery isn't all that talented, he's not really running that well. And he, he's a full-fledged bell cow. He, you don't need to worry about volume with him. He is getting the volume. Jared Smola tweeted out his usage last week, and it's been like this since Street Cohen got hurt. 85% of snaps, 19 of 20 running back carries, 12.8% target share. Obviously, he, he wrote there, wait, but he sucks kind of argument. It's true. He, he's not that good, but he's getting great volume. You have to look at him in a similar vein. You look at Todd Gurley and David Johnson. They're probably not going to win you the, your league um, because their their volume is is bad volume because they're not very good, but they, they're getting volume and they're RB2s because of it. Uh, to Daryl Henderson, he's the opposite for him, to be honest. He hasn't been getting, if he was getting Montgomery volume, he'd be much better. Uh, than David Montgomery with it. He's been good, and he he looks like he's taking a stronghold of this job, getting top five red zone work among the entire running back position. Daryl Henderson ranks number four in red zone touches, and being number 13 in yards per touch helps as well. He's the guy that you start in this backfield if you're going to start any of them, but it is still a committee, so he's he's not going to exceed much more than 55% of snaps. Cam Akers is still going to be involved, as will uh, Malcolm Brown, but Daryl Henderson is the guy you want to be starting. Uh, to the wide receiver position in this game, again, it's pretty simple. Allen Robinson, Robert Woods, Cooper Cup. These are the three receivers you start. You don't fuck around with anyone else. Allen Robinson is not expected to be shadowed by uh, Jalen Ramsey, according to PFF. I don't know why or if I even buy that, but we'll keep that in mind as PFF slates him against Troy Hill and not against Jalen Ramsey. Again, I, I don't think I buy that. I think they're going to put Jalen Ramsey on him, but maybe they know something I don't. Maybe Jalen Ramsey hasn't been shadowing as much this year or whatever the case is. Um, the Bears are amongst the best in the NFL at defending wide receivers. So you definitely want to downgrade the two Rams guys from top 12 to 15, where they've always been so far this season to more top 20 guys, in my opinion. Uh, as you can see, Robert Woods going up against Kyle Fuller, not a great matchup for him. And then Cooper Cup going up against uh, Buster Screen. It's a solid matchup, but again, for whatever reason, the, the Bears have just been stingy against the pass. Maybe it's like the pace that they play at or something. I have no idea, but the Bears um, or the Rams receivers will probably have a bit of a down game in this one. And they didn't have that great of a game uh, last week either against the uh, Niners. So to the tight end position in this game, and then we'll get out of here. Uh, you stream Tyler Higby and you start Jimmy Graham. Both guys are usable as both defenses are a bit more vulnerable to this position than they are to receivers and running backs. Uh, Higby isn't anywhere near the top eight tight end that you drafted. But again, he is still streamable because of the grossness of the position. And speaking of the grossness of the tight end position, Jimmy Graham is a top 12 tight end going forward, period, end of story. Nick Foles is using this dude. He's targeting him like crazy. That You got to treat Jimmy Graham as a top 12 tight end. It's disgusting in the year 2020, but that's where we're at. So as I mentioned, guys, if you enjoyed this video, make sure you leave uh, a like on it. It helps us tremendously. Comment any of your thoughts down below. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Uh, check out all the links in the description, links to our affiliates, links to Jock Market, all that good stuff. Uh, peace out, guys, and enjoy Wednesday.